For centuries, Christians have been known as men and women of prayer, people who lift up their cares and concerns to the Father in heaven. Why is that? Why do we pray? We pray because it aligns the mind of the Christian with the will of Christ. We pray because Jesus commanded us to pray at all times, in all places. We pray because the God who knows all and sees all, hears all. We pray because it is the blessed link between human weakness and divine omnipotence. We pray, not because it is some religious rule, but because the Lord is God. We pray because it is the most simple and practical way to say, I am not God. We pray, not because it is a burden to us, but because it liberates us from all other burdens. We pray, because it is exactly what the devil does not want us to do. We pray, because God can do more in five seconds than we can do in five years. We pray because it is the one thing that supersedes everything else on our to-do list today. We pray because we are too busy not to pray. We pray because somewhere, sometime, someone prayed for us. And we pray because the greatest tragedy of the Christian life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Prayer is powerful. That's why we pray. Good morning, Mountain Movers. How are we feeling this morning? Not very energetic. That was pathetic. That was really bad. <laughs> I hope the online family is way How's the online family doing this morning? Right? Come on, blow up the chat this morning. Hey, we're glad to be with you uh, today. Uh, so how many of you guys would agree that you have experienced for yourself the power of prayer in your life? Raise your hand. Prayer is powerful. God is able to do anything he wants to do just by the show of hands in this room and those hopefully reacting uh, online this morning. There's a lot of us, they, we know the power of prayer. We know that God is able to do far more than we could ever imagine or even think. But, but for a second, let's just ask ourselves, what about all those times that we've prayed and God doesn't answer our prayers? How many of you guys have ever experienced that? You've prayed prayers and, and you just feel like, God, like what, why are you not answering my prayers? You know, I think the closer we get to Jesus and our walk with him, a lot of, uh, a lot of answers come. The closer we get, you know, just think about the fact that before Christ, our life was so empty and it, and it lacked direction and purpose and fulfillment. And when Jesus steps onto the scene, when he comes into our hearts and, and fills our lives, we immediately begin to experience this peace and this hope and this fulfillment and this fullness. And so we, so these answers begin to come to us and we realize, okay, that's what I was missing. Like Jesus is the answer. So all these answers, they come. But it's like the closer we get to God and the more we dig into his word, it's, it's almost like more questions arise. Sometimes it feels like we have more questions than answers. And we find ourselves asking this question, why God? Have you ever asked God that question? Why God? And then you can just fill in the blank. God, why? Why, 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 why did you do this? Or why did you not do this? Or why did you allow this to happen? Or couldn't it have been this way? Why God? Why God? Why? I'm sure all of us in this room have a lot of why God questions. And over the next few weeks, we're going to cover some pretty common why God questions with you. And today we're going to bring you part one, why God won't you answer my prayers. Before we dive in today, we're going to go over a couple really cool things that God is doing here at Mountain Movers. And you can obviously see that the walls are now gone. Last Sunday, that wall was there, but it's gone, which is awesome. Um, you know, in the next few weeks, you're going to begin to see that we're going to put in 260 additional seats around this room as the risers are poured in here. But you know, one of the things that as staff, we've been praying about and asking God, like, how do we make this better? We're always about making things better. And we realize that things around here are getting a little bit crowded on campus. All right. Last Sunday morning, um, the sanctuary was full every service. 
The lobby was full every service. The parking lot was full every service. And so as a staff, we came together and we decided, you know what, the way we're going to provide a little bit of relief as we are preparing for all of the expansion in this room is we are going to change our service times just a smidge. Say a smidge. A smidge. Don't freak out. We're not going to four yet. We're just going to extend. We're just going to change our times just a little bit so that the lobby has a little bit more space. So when you're out there, you're not just shoulder to shoulder. And the parking lot will have a little bit of room. So here's what's going to happen. They're going to kick up on the screen for you. The new time's coming on September 29th. All right, that's four weeks to get ready for the change. I'm giving you plenty of transition time. We'll be 8.15, 9.50, and 11.35. Now, you can snap a pic of that, but I'll be telling you every single week, we'll put it on social, we'll blast it out in front of your face. You will forget what time the service is you're attending right now. Yeah. Just, it's gone. 9.50 is your new time. And we okay? don't expect you to remember these times because I can't even tell you what the times are now. That's why we have an app and a website. So if you ever forget, just look on there and you'll know exactly when you need to be here or just come at any time. And any time during the day, any time during the morning, you'll make a, a service. service. is going to happen. But really, sincerely... We want people to feel comfortable and at home when they're here on campus. Yeah. We want people to be able to go get a coffee, stand around for a moment with their friends and not feel like they're completely cramped. And so this is going to give us a little bit more time in between. It will also do one other cool thing, and that is it's going to give us a little bit extra time in the service where we can allow you to engage in worship a little bit this longer. This is my favorite part. This is our favorite. Um, a lot of times we are honestly going over the time that we had allotted for our services because we, we don't want to shut down what God is doing in the altars. And yeah. so this is going to allow us a little bit more time to be in the altars, to go after God, but also hopefully for our lobbies to clear a little and our parking lot before the next service arrives. So know our hearts. We're not just trying to make change just to drive you crazy, but <laughs> here's what happens as you grow, guys. As you grow, there has to be change. And right. here's the growth cycle we talk about a lot at MMC change, conflict, growth. We think we like change until change happens. And then if we're not careful, we become the conflict. So as I say so many times, don't be the conflict because this church is growing. And what is it all about? Lives, Lives being, being changed. changed. That's what it's all yeah. about. Guys, in the month of August, we welcomed in 127 brand new people to MMC in August alone. All right? It's pretty awesome. That's why we're adaptable and we don't mind changing. We will always make room for more families to come and experience the presence of God in this house. Amen. Okay, so we all or at least most of us in this room, most of us, you know, that are online this morning, we agree that God is powerful. We agree that God hears our prayers and that God answers prayers. We personally, and I'm sure if we opened it up, many could share some huge miracle stories. Maybe you know somebody or you personally, somehow you've experienced God in a massively powerful way where God answered your prayers or maybe just some big, huge miracle happened in your family. So, so I would say by and large, most of us agree and we're on the same page that, man, God answers prayers, okay? But then there's those times where it just doesn't make sense and, and where God, you're not answering my prayers. Like, why is it that I feel like I'm just praying to this brick wall. What is it? So we're going to dig in today and we're going to give you five things and we're going to, we're going to cover these things and show you really some legitimate scriptural reasons as to maybe why God isn't answering your prayers. But what do we do with scriptures like John chapter 14 and uh, 13 through 14, which says you can ask for anything yep. in my name. This is Jesus. And he says, I will do it. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. There are scriptures like this that we come across and as we're studying, we're learning to understand what God has to say about our prayer life and, and our, the way we engage with him. And you look at scriptures like this and you take them for face value. And, you, and, and by looking at it, any of us would agree, okay, then, then I can literally, I can pray that God would give me that job that I applied for because I have wanted that job for the last 10 years and it would be perfect for my family. It's exactly what we need. This is exactly what we need and I'm praying, but yet... God doesn't answer my prayer. But according to the scripture, anything that I pray, God is going to do it. 
So if you've experienced this in your life where you've prayed for something earnestly and you believed with all your heart and you had all the faith in the world to believe that this was a God thing and this is a good thing and it should happen and I'm praying and I'm believing, but then it doesn't happen. Then there's something that we're not understanding about the passage because God, you can take him at his word. He's not a liar. He, he will do what he says he will do, and you can count on him. So sometimes there's scriptures we come across, and, and maybe we're just not understanding what it means. With, when we read it at face value, it's saying something different than what God really intended. And this is one of those verses, and there's a handful of these verses at face value that you really feel like, man, I should be able to pray for anything, and it should happen. Something we have to learn as you're studying God's word is that you can never just take one verse or even a handful of verses that seem like they're very similar in nature and build a belief system off of that. You have to take what uh, Acts 20 and 27 calls the whole counsel of God into consideration when you study God's word. Scripture interprets scripture. So when you come across scripture that doesn't really line up with another scripture, then you need to dig deeper. Say dig deeper. Dig deeper. As students of the word of God, we need to right. dig deeper right. and find out, okay, we know that God's not a liar. So what is God saying that I'm not understanding? We have to take into consideration the whole counsel of God. You know, if we're going to talk about these five things that could possibly be hindering our prayers, before we do that, we really want to talk about for just a moment what prayer is and what prayer isn't. All right, because I think sometimes we kind of have misunderstood what the purpose of prayer really is. Let me start with what prayer isn't. Prayer isn't about you having this God like a genie in a bottle. That whenever you have a want or a need, you can just rub that lamp lamp. and you can just say, I got three things right now that I just want to see happen. And God is just going to be like, bam, bam, bam. Boom, boom, boom. That's not the purpose of prayer. You see, the purpose of prayer is not so that God will accomplish your will, but rather so that you can grow closer to God in an intimate and personal relationship so that you can understand God's will for your life. You see, we get it mixed up. We think that when we pray, sometimes it's like, God, I got this list of things. We come to God with a list of things we want to see God do. But really, you got to understand why prayer. It's about you growing closer and more intimate with your Father in heaven. Now, if you're married, you probably understand that it took you time in a relationship with your spouse to build some trust. Would you agree with that? Trust isn't built without having conversation and friendship. And see, the same thing happens in our life with our Father. When you begin to spend time in prayer, what you begin to do is you begin to understand God more. You begin to understand the character of God more. You begin to trust God more. How many parents do we have in the room? Raise your hand if you're a parent. All right. So obviously as parents, our children come to us and they have needs and desires, right? They have wants. How many of you guys, every time your kid comes to you, you give them everything they want? Raise your hand. Nobody? You're laughing. Got a few. Oh, we got one. Okay. We got a few. (laughs) The fact is, as parents, we understand. There are some times that my kids have asked for things that I knew that wasn't going to be good for them. How about, I don't want to go to school today. Okay, baby, you stay in bed, sweetheart. You know what? You don't have to get up. I don't want to go to work. You know what? That's okay, sweetie. You just roll back over, tuck yourself in. My kids are like old now. They're adults. The fact is we all know that the answer isn't always yes. And this is what we need to understand about prayer. When we're talking about unanswered prayers, really, we need to understand that God has three answers. It's either yes, wait, or no. Truly, every prayer has an answer, but we are not ourselves always understanding All three. See, we like yes. We're all about the yes, man. And I've seen God do miracles, and I believe 100,000%. God can do anything he wants to do. But many, many times, God says, wait, not now. It's not the right timing. But then sometimes, and we don't like this one, God says no. 
He just flat says no. And we as pastors have seen so many times when God says no, this is when people turn their back on God because they didn't have enough trust to understand that God still loves them and God is still good. And even when God doesn't do everything I want him to do, if the answer is no, he still is God and he's still good and he's still sovereign. Come on, that's good. But the fact is when we're praying, there are some things that we can do to stop hindering our prayers. And that's really what we want to focus on today. So we're going to look at five things. We're going to go through a lot of scripture because the word of God needs to be our counsel when we're doing this, okay? Yes. So we're going to take a lot of notes. If, you're, if you have your journals, you're going to get it out. But we're going to start with the first one. And I'm, I ain't going to lie, this is going to hurt. It is. Um, Move your toes. I'm just going to tell you, <laughs> when you dig into God's word, you have to come at it with a, an attitude uh, that says, God, it's not what I want, but it's, it's what you want for me and my life. Yeah. And so, you know, would you rather us feed you a line of bowl and sugarcoat it all, or do you want to know the truth as to why your prayers aren't being answered? All right, let's, let's, go, let's get into the, into the true stuff, and let's figure this out. I don't know about you, man, but I want God to answer my prayers. And so the first thing is unconfessed habitual sin, all right? This is a reality that all of us have to deal with. If, and we're talking about habitual. Now, right. you know, we're not talking about if you have sin in your life. If that were the case, none of our prayers would be answered, right. okay? None of us in this room, including myself, starting with me. So what we're talking about is when you allow sin to remain in a cycle in your life and you're making no effort to resist the enemy in that situation and flee from it. You're not making any effort to overcome the temptation in your life and draw closer to God and set yourself apart in holy living, in right positioning with God. When you make no effort and you're allowing sin to remain and continue, you can just, you can just know that you know that you know there is this block happening. Like you are building a brick wall between you and God because scripture is very clear. Sin separates. Right. I know this isn't like the best preaching you've ever heard, but this, you've yeah. got to get this in your spirit and understand it. Sin, when we allow sin into our lives, sin separates us from God. Doesn't mean God doesn't love you anymore. Absolutely not. He gave himself for you. But scripture is very clear that when we allow sin to become full grown in our lives, you can read about it in the book of James, it brings forth death. Death in your relationship with God. It severs relationship. And in Isaiah it says that he is, because of sin, because of our iniquities, that God has hidden his face from us. Not, not, not by his choice. It's not on him. It's on us. So we have to make this, this, this conscious effort to set ourselves aside from the things that displease God and cling to the things that please God. And we'll begin to see those things unfold where God is beginning to really answer prayers according to his will. Psalm 66 verse 18 says, if I had not confessed the sin of my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Let it sink in. Do you have unconfessed sin in your life? Right now, I want you to just by the power of the Holy Spirit revealing these things to you, ask God to forgive you of your sins right now and make a conscious effort that from this moment forward, you are going to make the steps necessary to start living a holy life in that area of your life. Isaiah 59 verse one through two says, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away. And you know, uh, w sometimes we don't think of this as a sin, but it's, you can just group it. You can group them right together, and that is disobedience. If God has told you to do something, either in his word, and he, he gives us a lot of commands. There's a lot of things that he instructs us as children of God to do if you don't do those things, you're living in disobedience. I'm living in disobedience. Or if, you know, we just came out of this series hearing from God. If you feel like the Lord has specifically told you to do something, yeah. right, to help someone or, or, or give someone money or whatever it is he's laid on your heart. Like you heard Pastor Grant talking a moment ago about his daughter, Carly, how, how she, God had told her to go to Bible college and she wasn't doing it. She was in disobedience and thus she wasn't hearing from God. So if God's told you to do something, man, I'm gonna blow your mind right now. This is gonna be the best advice you've received all day. 
do it. <laughs> just obey. Obey the Lord. Whatever God tells you to do, just do it. Again, I want to just kind of bring it back to parenting. You know, if your kid is being disobedient, just think about this. If your kid is just totally defying you, you've laid it out very clearly what they're supposed to do, and they are absolutely not doing it. But then they come to you and they're like, hey, mom, can so-and-so come over and stay the night tonight? What do you think the answer is going to be? No. And well, can I go to their house? I mean, well, 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 mom, please. No. Why? We don't bless disobedience. As humanity, we understand that good parents don't bless disobedience. And so in our relationship with God, guys, it's the same thing. He doesn't bless our disobedience. All but right. he does bless our obedience. But he does bless our Come obedience. On. Yes, he does. All right, number two. This was fun. I know this is tough. I told Brad backstage, I was like, you know, they're just not shouting today. They can like, handle this was it. first service. This is a tough church. I was like, nobody's this is a shouting. Tough church family. It's not fun to preach, but you need to hear this stuff. All right. Number two, unresolved conflict. What do I mean? Someone does you wrong. Someone says something. Someone does something. Maybe you were completely innocent. Maybe it was when you were a kid and you were an innocent, precious child that someone took advantage of. They did you wrong. The fact is, the Bible makes it really clear. If we have unforgiveness in our heart, that it can hinder our prayers. Let me show you. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 25, it says, but when you are praying first, say first, First, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. Why? So that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. You know, a lot of times as humans, when we are hurt, we feel like we are justified in holding that grudge and holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness. We're like, they don't deserve my forgiveness. But can I just shoot you real straight, and I think you probably know this deep down, is that we think we're hurting the other person and they deserve to be hurt, but the fact is the only thing that unforgiveness will do in your life is rot you from the inside out. You do not have to be best friends with someone who has hurt you. You do not have to even hang out with them, okay? You may never want to speak to them again, and that's okay. The Bible doesn't say you got to be buddy-buddy with them in order for God to hear your prayers. That's not what it says. What it says is you have to first forgive. And I'm just going to be honest. There are those people in your life that you're like, Misty, you don't understand how bad they hurt me. Let me help you out, okay? Jesus went to the cross, for every single person who will ever breathe a breath on planet earth. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have done things that were wrong. And yet Jesus took our sins and went to the cross. And what God is saying is each and every one of you are my children. And I have chosen to forgive every one of you that call on me and ask. So who are you to declare that someone doesn't deserve forgiveness? But God really knows that it's destroying you. And that's why he says, let it go. And so I want to encourage you, if, if you're one of those and you're like, man, right now, like you see names, you see faces, you remember situations and you're holding on to it. Listen. You may have to start confessing it with your mouth before you feel it in your heart. You may have to start saying, God, I choose to forgive and put their name in that spot. Say it every day over and over. God, I choose in your prayer time. God, I choose to forgive. And I'm telling you, there will come a point where what you're saying with your mouth, you'll begin to feel in your spirit because God will bring about healing in your own life, in your spirit, in your emotions. You will have healing. Guys, if you've been married any length of time, your spouse will say or do something that will hurt you. And if you hold on to that and every time you have a little spout, you bring up the past and you go and you get that thing and you're like, here you go. Remember when you did that? So many marriages.
marriages are destroyed because somebody's not willing to just let it go and forgive. You'll want to experience real freedom. You'll want God to hear your prayers. You've got to resolve the conflict. All right, the Bible speaks of another area of unresolved conflict that could be hindering your prayers. Women, you get to take a time out for just okay, a second. Okay, you get a break for a second, girls. is directly involving men, specifically husbands. Yes. As, lead, as husbands, we are the leaders of the home. We are the house band. We are the ones who God has called to protect and to love and to honor and respect um, the women and the children that God has placed in our lives. And with that responsibility um, comes consequences when we abuse our position or power that God has given us. God has given us strength for the purpose of protecting and taking care of uh, the women in our lives. But when we abuse that, here's what happens. In 1 Peter 3 and 7, it says, Husbands, dwell with them, your wife, with understanding. That means listen means be open-minded. Don't be the one talking all the time, but actually listen to what she has to say. Try to understand where she's coming from. Be empathetic, but also give honor to the wife. Honor means to make yourself low and to elevate someone above you. It's servanthood. It's Jesus. Jesus is the, is the ultimate example of humility. He made himself low. He was servant to all. We talked about this in the marriage series that we did. As husbands, we are called to make ourselves low to serve our wives and to lift them up and honor them and cherish them, protect them and adore them. When we in any way, shape or form abuse this power or this privilege as the husband, our answers are so hindered that in some versions, it says that your prayers won't get above your head. In other words, God says, take care of my daughter. That's daddy's girl. Take care of his daughter, honor her, love her, cherish her and maybe God will start answering your prayers. That's good. And I will just say this, wives, you don't need to make that your rhema word, okay? You don't need to like, you don't need to take that one and memorize it and hold it close to your heart and bring it up every time he goes on jerk mode on you, okay? That's not your responsibility. You can pray for your husband, but let me just tell you from personal experience, quoting the word of God to them in those moments isn't going to get you anywhere. Let God do that work for you, okay? All right, number three, wrong motives. When we pray with the wrong selfish motives, this hinders our prayers. Check out James 4, verse 2 and 3. It says this, you don't have what you ask for it because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what gives you pleasure. Now, you can look through the word of God and you can see different instances when people were praying prayers with the wrong motives. I'll give you one. In the New Testament, you'll see these two disciples coming to Jesus and they were asking Jesus if when Jesus set up his new kingdom, could I sit on the right hand and the left hand of you and rule right there with you? And they wanted it so bad. They actually had their mama come and ask, all right? They were asking with wrong motives. That wasn't for them to decide what God was going to do, who was gonna rule on the right or the left. Let me give you an example from my own life. Growing up, I was an athlete and I loved to win. To this day, I love to win, okay? I'm a very competitive person. Anytime we went into a game, I'd gather up our team, man, and I'm all about the power of prayer. We would pray that we would crush the other team. The other Christian team. All right? And that I was did, praying the same prayer. <laughs> I did go to a, a private Christian academy. And so we were, pr- we were playing other Christians. And as I got older, it became kind of humorous because I realized like, whose prayers is he listening to right now? You Come know on, what I'm girls. Saying? We need to have faith that's just a little bit stronger than theirs. All right. All right. Beat them on three. <laughs> but the right? fact is, <laughs> I was praying with wrong motives. Now, did I still pray before every game? Yes. But I changed my prayer as I developed and grew in my relationship to God help us to give our very, very best. Whatever that is, all right, that would be the right motive. But you can pray sometimes selfish prayers, and those are going to hinder you from getting an answer. All right, number four. Our number four is a lack of faith. And here's what we're saying. 
don't don't rant. You know, you're you're, you're praying these prayers and, and you're you're you know believing by faith, if you will, that God is going to answer this particular prayer. But out of this, out of the other side of your mouth, maybe that same week, because you're walking by sight and not by faith. Scripture says that we walk by faith and not by sight. You're not seeing things align the way that you think they shouldn't. So you start ranting and going on and on about how God isn't answering your prayers or God isn't going to answer your prayers. And with faith like that, he's probably not. And let's get this straight. You know, there are some things that when, that when you have faith, God is going to answer. And we have seen God literally move mountains with faith, believing that God is able. We've seen him do things that would just, just have absolutely blown our mind. So we know that faith works. We know that God answers prayer. But James James says in chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. He'll not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't let your faith be wavering. Don't let it be divided. Make sure that when you come to God and you approach him in faith and you're believing, and this is according to his will, according to scripture, the answer is going to be yes, then make sure that you have the faith to back it up. Yeah, I mean, all right, number five. And I think we see this one probably more times than possibly others. And that is simply this. Your prayers don't line up with God's will. You know, when we pray, we often don't understand what God's will is in a given situation. We know what we want our will to be. And so, so many times when we're praying, we're praying according to our will because that's just by nature what we want to do. But we've got to understand that we need to be praying according to God's will. And the scripture we opened with that said, if you ask anything in my name, it will happen. The context behind that is if you ask anything according to my will, it will happen. But the fact is you ask yourself, how do I know the will of God? Well, that's another message for another day. But the number one way you're gonna know that is by getting into the word of God, getting close to God, being able to hear the voice of God. But I can tell you, there are going to be those moments when you're just not sure. And you say, well, then how do I pray? This is how you pray. God, I know that you can. God, I believe that you will. But God, more than anything else in our life, God, we want your will to be done. And I'm gonna be really honest, that is a hard prayer to pray. Because there are some times in your life when all you can see is the answer that you want to see happen. You can't see anything else. And it's not a lack of faith to pray, God, your will be done. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, if you go and you look in Matthew to the Lord's prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. You know, we memorize that little passage of scripture and we'll teach on it soon. And we'll teach you through how to pray that that passage. But when you pray, you should always pray, God, your will be done. As we're wrapping up today, I want to take you to a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is a story about the Apostle Paul. Now, if you know the Apostle Paul, he is a guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was a church planter who planted churches all across the countryside. He loved God so much. His life had radically been changed. He had prayed for so many people and seen miracles happen. But in this passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible says that Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And the passage tells us that he begged God. He begged God three times to take it. Now, you might think to yourself, was like just three times he just said, Lord, take whatever this is. No. I believe this is like three seasons, long seasons of time where he was fervently asking God to remove it. Now, theologians have debated for many years, what exactly was this thorn in his flesh? And there's a lot of different ideas. Maybe it was a sickness in his body. Maybe it was an infirmity. Maybe it was a relationship. We are not quite sure, but what we are sure of is this. 
God did not give Paul the answer he wanted. I wanna read this passage for you. Second Corinthians chapter 12. I'm gonna start in verse seven and it says, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said this, my grace is all you need. Because my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, when we read this passage, many, many times we quote that in part, God, when I'm weak, you're strong. But we don't correlate the fact that the context of that is that he had begged God to take this away. He had begged God in three long seasons of prayer and God's answer to him was no. And yet what God told him was my grace is all you need. I want you to understand that as your pastors, as Brad said, we've walked through for many, many years watching God do miracles. And when we tell you to come forward, we wanna pray over you. We fully believe that God can do anything. But I also want you to understand that there are times in our life when God's answer doesn't align with what we want. And it's not in those moments that we should turn our back. I wanna tell you that when we were young in our faith, our son, AJ, before he was born, the doctors told us that AJ had a brain tumor, that he had, his kidneys were enlarged, that he had a club foot and a cleft palate, and that he would more than likely be born with Down syndrome. We were sent to many, many specialists during the course of my pregnancy from 20 weeks all the way to the day I had him. And with every specialist, they tried to convince us to abort this baby. But we don't make that choice. God gives life. But Brad and I knew that God could heal. We weren't sure that God would heal, but we knew that God could heal. And we prayed by faith, believing that God would heal our son. But as we struggled and we wrestled with that prayer, let me tell you when we got peace in our spirit is when I finally said, God, I know that you can heal. I believe that you will heal, but even if you don't, we're still gonna praise you. We'll never turn our back on you. We'll still live out the calling you have on our life. And throughout that pregnancy, every time I went to the doctor, they told me something else was wrong. Every single appointment, every specialist, there was another complication, there was another problem. And the day I had him, they rushed AJ out of the room. I, I didn't even get to see his face. He was born, they swooped him up and took him straight to the NIC unit. And for the next five days, they ran test after test after test after test. And I wanna tell you that our God is a miracle working God. In five days, they came back and they said, you can take your son home. There's nothing wrong with that child. We don't know what to say. It was a total miracle. That built up our faith like never before as we started planting this church. Age was born before we came here. Man, we had so much faith to believe God to do miracles. But then a few years later, my brother got a bad diagnosis. And I don't even like to talk about this, but I do today because I feel like you need to understand. He was 36 years old and he got a diagnosis in the fall that he had lung cancer. And as a family, we rallied around him and we believed with everything inside of us. And I can tell you as your pastor, there wasn't one ounce of doubt. I had watched God 
do miracles. And I believed every scripture we stood on. But on April 23rd of 2013, my brother was healed, but he wasn't healed this side of heaven. And I can tell you that I wrestled hard with God. I felt like God had let me down. I felt like I had done everything I was supposed to do. I had every bit of faith to believe that God would heal him and he did it. That's when we went back to the word and we began to study a little harder, dig a little deeper, to begin to understand that there are times in our life when we don't understand God's perfect will. And I stand here today, years later, still very difficult to walk back through those memories in my mind. But here's what I know is that our God is sovereign. And when we pray, we still believe with every fiber of our being that our God can do anything because he can. And we still believe by faith that when we lay hands on someone that they can be healed instantly. They can be healed, a miracle still happen. But when we pray, we also need to have a sense of understanding that our God is the creator of the universe who sits on a throne in heaven and his will is not always our will. And when we don't get what we want, we don't turn our back and walk away and say, you didn't do what I wanted you to do. And so God, why are you supposed to be a good God when you let bad things happen to good people? The fact is, even when bad things happen, God is still good. And you know the good thing is? My brother is in heaven today. My brother is in the throne room of God this morning, worshiping at the throne. Even though we think bad things happen, what we need to understand is that we live in a temporary world. That what happens here on this world right here is because we live in an earth curse system, but God is eternal. And if you have made Jesus the Lord of your life, then you are promised eternity in heaven. And that's what it's all about. So today I want you to understand as you bow your heads that if you've got any of these five things in your life, maybe you've got unconfessed sin or maybe you've got unforgiveness in your heart. Maybe you've struggled with that lack of faith, bouncing back and forth with God, I know you can, but grumbling all day long that he won't do it. Maybe you're not aligning your prayers with God's will. If any one of those are happening, I want you just right now just to begin to recognize that and begin to say, God, forgive me. God, I want your will to be done in my life. God, whatever it is, begin as a disciple of Jesus Christ every day when you pray to recognize that you don't want these things hindering you. God, I just pray right now, Jesus, over your people. God, in-house and online, God, I just pray, Lord, if there's anything that is hindering our prayers, God, I pray that we would sense it and remove it in the powerful name of Jesus. God, that nothing would stand between us and you. And God, that we would begin to draw closer in a more intimate relationship with you, understanding, God, that you are a good God and that you are sovereign. God, that you love us and you have a perfect will for each of our lives. With heads bowed and eyes closed you can experience the same salvation that Misty's brother experienced and have the same assurance and the same hope of knowing no matter what happens this side of heaven, that heaven is your home. That there is eternity waiting on the other side. There's the promise of heaven as your hope. You can experience salvation through Christ by asking God to forgive you of your sins, repenting of your sins, turning away from those things that displease him, believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God and asking him to come and live inside your heart and rule and reign on the throne of your heart, confessing him as Lord. 
we're going to help you walk through a prayer of salvation right now for those that would be making this decision. If you are making this decision today, would you just raise your hand right now so we know who we're praying with this week? If you're watching online, just comment all in in the comment section below. But if that's you right now, would you just lift your hand up high? Last service, we saw two people give their lives to Christ. Who would be next? Who would say, I want to know Jesus in a real way. I want to make heaven my home. Raise your hand nice and high. We're going to pray this prayer together. Together. Pray this prayer. Father God, Father God I, know that I'm a sinner, I know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Of a savior. I, believe I believe with all my heart, all my heart Jesus, Jesus is, that savior. is that Savior. It's only through Him, it's only through him I, can I can be saved. So I ask for you ask to forgive me to forgive of my sins. I confess Jesus, I confess Jesus to be Lord of my life, Lord. never to be the same be again, again from this moment forward. Thank you, God, that you hear my prayers. I pray, Lord, that you would show me anything in my heart that needs to change. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, that is by far the best decision you will ever make in your life. And I want to encourage you to just text the words life change to 844-MMC-NEXT. You can just snap a pic of that screen and do it later this afternoon. But that's gonna give you a message from Brad and I. What do you do after you pray the prayer of salvation? You invite Jesus in. Also, we have a gift for you. It's called the Next Step Kit. And as you exit, if you're here on campus, it's gonna be between those double doors. Grab one of those. It's got a brand new Bible. It's got these steps laid out for you. We wanna come alongside of you we want to help you. If you're online, just direct message us your address. We'll mail you that gift in the morning. Well, guys, I want to just encourage you. If you are hungry and you want to grow in your relationship with God, the best way to do it is to come back and be a part of Midweek. Midweek happens on Tuesday and Wednesday, and we have groups for every age and every stage. And this is really where you dig into the Word of God, you discuss what we've been teaching here on Sundays, and you grow. So I want to encourage you to do that also this week. We have a challenge for you. Wednesday through Friday is our corporate fast, and this is something we've been doing since about 2010. Every month, we fast together as a church from the first Wednesday to Friday of the month. And God laid this heavy on our hearts as pastors, and so we're obedient to this. But sometimes, guys, when you're really wanting a breakthrough in prayer, the thing that you really need to do, if all those other things that are hindering you, those are taken care of, you might wanna try adding fasting with your prayers. But we challenge you to be a part. Fast one or two meals. Take that time to pray Wednesday through Friday. We love y'all. Have a great week. We hope to see you, you back guys. here God Tuesday bless. or Wednesday night.